Google eBooks is not yet successful because they haven't delivered devices. Devices bring people into the market. And even though they wind up using their platform on other devices, it seems that customer acquisition revolves around devices, which is a very interesting thing. But you have to have all three elements. Kobo, this little Canadian company that I've dismissed at least a dozen times, keeps showing us that they're for real. They're not only for real, they're, I want to give them the credit that's due here. What would Kobo do? Well, Kobo has managed to go into France and the UK with core partnerships, a la the Nook is in Barnes & Noble, and with Smiths and Fnac now as their core partners in those markets. This is broadening the world of e-books overnight. Um, the UK, which is a year ago we said was three years behind the US in e-books. Right now I'd say they're 18 months behind. And by the time we get to London Book Fair, it'll be only six months behind the US in, in the e-book development process. Because it's full on and they've gotten to learn from the experience that happened in the US. Kobo now has a new tablet coming out. And this is not just the plain you know, e-ink screen devices we're seeing anymore. Everyone's coming out with high-powered Android-based tablets, which is going to be a very interesting strain on what's happening in Cupertino these days. So let's talk about what's happening in Cupertino. New business models. We didn't just go through a digital revolution. We went through a commerce revolution in book publishing. We, for the first time that anyone can remember, considered a new business model in how we sell our content. There's agency, which is this new model that we were working, that people work with Apple on. And of course, our initial model, which is the wholesale model. Um, so let's just go over the basics. Retailer is a seller of record when you're talking about the wholesale model. Publisher sets a recommended retail price. Re <coughs> retailer, though, decides what they're going to price the product to the consumer. Um, retailer emits the list or RRP price minus the discount they get. So if they get a 50% discount, they give what, no matter what they sell the product for, they give the publisher the list price minus 50%. And of course, they do all the taxes and all that kind of stuff. Agency model is a complete inversion of this. The publisher is actually the seller of record. The publisher sets one price to the consumer. There's no RRP and actual sale price. There's just a price, and there's one price. The retailer does not touch that price. The retailer does not act like a reseller. The retailer acts as an agent or what we also known as a commissionaire. They receive a commission off the sale, not a discount off of the purchase. Interesting, the taxes may be collected then by the retailer, but all the processing and ownership and management of that has to be done by the publisher of this model. So why isn't everyone immediately on agency? Well, there's some complications to that. Um, first of all, agency served a really, 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 really important purpose. I don't want to undercut how impactful agency has been on the ebook world because effectively it was the only way that Barnes & Noble, Apple, and everyone else can compete effectively with Amazon without having to result, resort to dropping the prices. Because Amazon's game, remember, is about loss leadership. Loss leadership, of course, means you will lose money on each transaction, but you will gain market share. If you can't do that, it's a bit of a fair game. And even though they had a tremendous lead and, and, and were out there first, great technology and all, by the rules changing and not being able to use price, all of a sudden there was a, a balance in the marketplace. This was really driven by the agents. Agents in our world really got concerned that their authors were earning royalties off of products that even though we were 
I mean, we were getting paid the same amount no matter why. They worried about the value being placed on me on $9.99 when the hard cover was $30. And that drove um, the big six publishers, well, at first the big five, over to um, join this agency model. When you have one retailer with a 90% market share, publishers will move mountains to try to figure out a way to, to counter that. Um, but agency's got to change. We've got some problems with it. Because the way it's been implemented, the model itself is an interesting one. But the way it's implemented at Apple, which is the only retailer who's full on pushing and making agency the only model they'll work with, um, they suggest price banding. So if you have a $25 hardcover, they suggest a range of pricing that you need to put your, your ebooks at. That has been challenged by certain circles as anti-competitive. Um, furthermore, there's another problem with agency. Not everyone will let you use it, which means if you are a small to medium-sized publisher and you say to, let's say, the world's largest online retailer, I want to go agency, they say, that's nice, but then we won't sell your books. So you can't. So what you have to do is run what's called a dual model. Now, dual model sounds fine. Oh, great. All right. Amazon's going to have it at one price. Apple will have it at the other. But won't that hurt Apple if Amazon drops the price? And of course, yes, it will. So they have something called an MFN, Most Favorite Nations Clause. And it says and it's, it's only for books that are seven months older or less, that are under $25. There's a, there's a few things that cast out a bunch of books, but your core front list is subject to a, a Most Favorite Nations Clause. And what that says is if Amazon drops it to $9.99 and you're selling it for $15.99, you have two days to drop it to $9.99. Now there's a problem in that. Because when Amazon sells it for $9.99, and let's say the, the list price was $25. When Amazon drops that price, they remit to you full retail price minus discount. When you're in the agency model and you have to drop that price, that's your price you're dropping. That means the author, the publisher, uh, the author and the publisher are getting less money. The retailer makes a decision to drop a price. That's the retailer's decision to earn less money. So by competing in a dual model with prices that can drop, publishers have to match that. And that is a real problem. So there's a lot of a lot of things that have to change before um, agency will be a global model that works for everyone. Okay, let's go into the big three because really there is no discussion in book publishing without a discussion of Amazon, Apple, and Google. They're all changing our lives every day. Let's think a little bit about that. Okay, um, oh, I didn't make that. I'll figure it out. Um, all right, so you know, Amazon's uh, um, have sales of 34.2 billion, market cap of 107 billion. They trade at 234 dollars per share. Um, their profit margin is interestingly low, isn't it? 3.35. It's a retailer, um, but it's a lost leader retailer, so they're willing to trade profit for market share. Um, they have about 375 billion on hand. Uh, 2010 sales of Apple, unbelievable, 76 billion. Um, their market cap of 364 billion. They traded 393. Their margin this is a hardware and software maker. A margin of 21.48 percent. That's remarkable. Um, and their cash on hand is almost 11 billion. Google, 2010, almost 30 billion. Um, Market cap of 191, they traded 590. They're almost a 30% profit margin. It's good to be in the aggregation of advertising business, isn't it? Um, and they only have 9 billion on hand. So let me put that into perspective. Global book sales last year for all industries, all the world, with 88 billion. The sales of those three companies alone, 
for 139 billion. In the UK, the entire market, trade publishing in the UK, five billion. And yet, Amazon, Apple, and Google have cash in the bank of nearly five times that. That is a remarkable perspective to put on. These are the, these are the three companies that all of our future 